Hey, it's Mike here, and today we're gonna to talk about the Fountain of Youth, and how maybe Ponce de Leon, the explorer famous for seeking out the Fountain of Youth, should have been, you know, combing through the peer-reviewed research instead of traipsing around what is now Florida, splashing his face with water. Classic Ponce. Okay, fine, it was like the 1500s and peer-reviewed journals weren't invented yet, but the point is, Ponce de Leon, according to myth, thought he found the Fountain of Youth, yet he died at age 47. Yeah, maybe that was senior citizenship back then, but the point is we can't keep waiting around to find this magical fountain or magical technological cure. We have what we need to know right now to increase our lifespan. In particular, perhaps the closest thing that we have to a fountain of youth today would be an equation that is constructed from the modern day peer reviewed research. So we're gonna go ahead and create that right now. Let's do it. And no, we're not here to work out some crazy equation that can make you immortal. For that, you'll have to wait a few decades and save about a billion dollars for such a treatment. Okay, so to start with, there is a torrent of research out there on mortality and lifestyle factors and aging, but they're rarely ever put in the same place and putting them all in the same place would be impossible, but we're about to start with an equation that starts to make a complete picture out of it. Here's a simple graphical preview of the equation. Stay tuned and we'll go through all the details of what all of these mean. It's super digestible. So to start, I think the foundation of this equation is oxidative stress. It is a force of aging that is second only to time. Oxidative stress is when a certain particle in our body is lacking electrons. And so it's trying to pull electrons from other cells in our body and that means it could be ripping apart our cells, ripping apart our DNA, leading to inflammation and cell death, etc. The problem with oxidative stress is that it just kind of happens. From this study, they say free radicals are a common outcome of normal aerobic cellular metabolism. In fact, from another study, quote, two to 5% of oxygen used in the mitochondria, that's the powerhouse of the cell, forms free radicals. Thanks, body. And looking at this pretty landmark study, the researchers looked at postprandial oxidative stress, which is our metabolic stress that occurs after eating a meal. Postprandial, after meal. Let's look at this chart, which is a measure of these subjects' blood levels of antioxidant status, oxidative stress absorbance capacity. After meal, you can see, swoop, it went down, which is absolutely not good. The researchers say, quote, the decline in plasma AOC following a carbohydrate meal might be expected since production of significant free radicals occurs during the metabolism of carbohydrate and the utilization of oxygen. Really quick tangent before you go, oh my God, it's just the carbs. The carbs are evil. Keep in mind that the Okinawans who are the longest living population on earth until they changed their diet were traditionally eating about 85% of their calories from carbohydrates. So don't run off and chug coconut oil, please. And we're actually gonna have a place for low carb diets in this equation, so stay tuned. Okay, back to the chart. The amazing part is that eating blueberries, for example, blunted that postprandial oxidative stress. So they did a lot of this type of research, compiled a bunch of information to figure out what it would take to destroy that after meal oxidative stress. How many antioxidants do you need to eat to offset a certain amount of calories? And they figured that out in the unit known as Trolox equivalence. Duh. Just know that it is a unit of antioxidant capacity, of antioxidant power. In fact, they even made an equation about it, one which we can use to help with our equation. Ponce, do you, do you mind reading it for me? E-L, dark mark, E-A-N-U, L, nine, nine, five, seven, vente cinco, L, zero, 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 four, six, one. How did I do, Mick? Uh, actually, it's Mike, and uh, you did horribly. Just like how you failed to find the Fountain of Youth. Oh, it cuts deep. Thankfully, they made a super simple linear chart on one axis. It's the amount of calories that you're consuming, and on another, how many antioxidants you should eat. And we can simply round up to 10 millimoles of antioxidants per 2,000 calories that you eat. So we've unlocked the first part of the equation, but we still have the question, how the heck do you eat 10 millimoles of antioxidants? And that brings us to table five of the study. It's actually quite simple. One cup of strawberries is six millimoles. So on a daily basis, you won't have to obsess over this and actually count it. You just can easily gain an intuition. And by eating whole plant foods, this is super achievable. Also side note, antioxidant supplements do not work. So don't even think about making shortcuts. Okay, now let's move on to the next part, which is fruits and vegetables. And surely there's an overlap in benefit between antioxidants and fruits and vegetables because fruits and vegetables contain antioxidants, but let's add them in anyway. From this study, this meta-analysis that looked at 2 million people, more fruits and vegetables meant less death, going all the way up to 10 servings per day, which resulted in a 31% decrease in mortality over the course of the study. So let's go ahead and add that 10 servings of vegetables and fruits per day. Boom, 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. 
All right, now let's move on to the third one, which is a big V for vegan. I have made the controversial and potentially triggering decision to add vegan into the equation because of studies showing that vegans have 15% lower mortality than their omnivore neighbors, among other things. And keep in mind, well, on the outside, this appears like a bias. The reason that I went vegan in the first place was because of studies like that one. Moving on, one potential reason for the lower mortality has to do with IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor one. We know that IGF-1 fuels every stage of cancer growth and spreading, so high levels pose a risk. And from this study, quote, a considerable amount of evidence is consistent with the proposition that systematic IGF-1 activity acts as a pace setter in the aging process. So higher IGF-1 may mean accelerated aging and of methods to reduce IGF-1. The researcher mentions whole food vegan diets, exercise, fiber, and some more intense ones that I don't think you wanna do, like taking appetite suppressants. And to back that up, from this study, animal protein appears to raise IGF-1 and vegans had lower blood levels of IGF-1 as well. Another reason a vegan diet is effective is that it blanketly cuts out some bad food groups. From this study, quote, both processed and unprocessed red meat intakes were associated with all-cause mortality and cause-specific mortality. The notion of adding a vegan diet to this equation is also supported by this study, which asks the question, can we gain 10 years of life by our lifestyle choices? And of the different dietary groups of Adventists that they looked at, Adventist vegetarians were the longest lived with 83.3 and 85.7 years for men and women. And if they had other healthy lifestyle factors like not smoking, they got up to 85.3 and 88.6 years, respectively. But that's vegetarians though, not vegans. Well, it appears from other studies that about 20% of Adventist vegetarians are vegan, and other studies on Adventist mortality show that vegans actually had a lower mortality rate than vegetarians, so who knows, it could be even longer. We also have the Ornish studies that showed that a whole food plant-based quasi-vegan diet plus life style changes actually increase the length of telomeres, which are the little caps on the end of your DNA. They're often likened to the little caps on the end of your shoelaces that keep them from fraying. And the length of those is a signifier of cellular aging of your DNA age. And to be clear, they describe their diet as quote, high in whole foods, plant-based protein, fruits, vegetables, unrefined grains and legumes, and low in fat, approximately 10% of calories and refined carbohydrates. Now the study has been criticized for a relatively small sample size and the simple fact that there were so many changes that you don't know which one was actually making the change. Was it the group therapy? Was it the diet? Was it the 30 minutes of walking? We can't say for sure. But there's really good evidence between this study and others that eating plants definitely helps. And one other lifestyle change by Ornish was adding meditation. So perhaps we should look into some type of stress relieving quiet time for the equation. This NIH funded study in the American Journal of Cardiology looked at people with high blood pressure that were taught transcendental meditation, a stress relieving meditation. And the results were quote, compared with combined controls, the transcendental meditation group showed a 23% decrease in the primary outcome of all cause mortality after maximum follow-up. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the equation in the form of greater than 30 minutes of stress relieving quiet time per day. Let's continue on the topic of diet in the realm of added refined sugar. Here is a study that looked at heart disease death and found that those who ate the most sugar had about three times the risk of death over the course of the study. The problem is the lower sugar group that they were compared to was still consuming up to 10% of their total calories from refined sugar. And that's basically drinking a 16 ounce Coke every single day. Because there is no clear point in the literature in which refined sugar doesn't do damage, I'm gonna go ahead and throw in the arbitrary number of eat less than 3% of total calories from sugar. If you have a better number, feel free to throw it at me and the research. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do something that could also ruffle a little bit of feathers, and that is saying no low carb dieting because according to this meta-analysis, it increased risk of mortality by about 30%. So bam, there it is. Since you could still be technically pounding down fried coconut oil foods on a vegan diet, I'm gonna go ahead and add in the American Heart Association's guideline of eating less than 5% of total calories from saturated fat. Why not? And if you have a problem with these last two points, feel free to watch my most recent video on Professor Tim Noakes, which covers the topics of low carb diets and saturated fat in greater detail. Next, we obviously need to add no smoking from the CDC smokers on average die 10 years earlier than non-smokers. No brainer, next. 
Let's move along to exercise from this general study on the topic looking at twins, quote, when compared to the sedentary twins, the adjusted risk of mortality was 33% lower among the twins who exercised occasionally and 44% lower among the physically active twins. And to this other study that looked at more specific exercise amounts, the mortality risk ratio for the least fit fifth compared with the most fit fifth were 3.44 in men and 4.65 in women. That's about three and a half to four and a half times more death with the least exercise. So how much exercise should be added to the equation? Well, it appears that about six to 10 METs may be ideal. Yeah, that's a really random unit and it's a complicated one. So let's look to Harvard for some simplifications of that. As you can tell, it's about one hour of vigorous exercise or two hours of light exercise. You know, one hour of calisthenics will get you there. Now, I know a few of you are probably wondering, well, Mike, how much exercise is too much exercise? I mean, metabolically, it would cause oxidative stress, right? First of all, tell me honestly, do you really need to worry about that? Probably not. Not getting enough exercise definitely kills way more people than getting too much exercise. But if it still does freak you out, feel free to go over to nutritionfacts.org and watch this video about how you can eat watercress, which is high in antioxidants to buffer the oxidative stress of exercise. Next up on the equation is sleep. From this meta-analysis, it appears that the sweet spot is about seven to nine hours per night. No surprise there. However, if you are sleeping a lot, that is also associated with higher mortality. Though it's unclear whether that is caused by sleeping too much or whether that is just an indicator of a state of sickness. Now for the final piece of the equation, you may have not been expecting it, and that is social relationships. This study found that those who had worse scores in the areas of belonging and loneliness had about twice the mortality rate of those that scored better. But it's obvious here that we are social tribal creatures from their conclusion, quote, the influence of social relationships on risk for mortality is comparable with well-established risk factors for mortality. Is a bad social life the new high cholesterol? Because of this, I've added the oversimplified factor of one or more hours of socializing a day or seeking some greater social purpose. You don't even have to have friends. This can be volunteering, or maybe you could just go and play sports and save two birds with one nest, getting the exercise and the socializing. Or it could be as simple as hanging out with people, whatever floats your boat, unless it's meth. Just because meth is with people does not make it okay. And even introverts really just need that social purpose. You could probably achieve that without even talking to people much. So to review the equation as it exists now, it's not necessarily completely done. We are talking about eating a high antioxidant diet that is comprised of plants with 10 or more servings of vegetables per day and low refined sugar and low saturated fat and not going on any low carb diets because they increase mortality as well as not smoking, getting enough sleep, getting that quiet time in and getting that social time in as well. Now, who knows, but judging from other studies like the one on the Adventist in JAMA, we could be looking at plus 10 years of life here with all the other factors. Who knows, maybe 15 or more. It's impossible to know. Obviously, it's just hedging our bets. None of that is set in stone. You could easily die of an accident at some point, and that would not be taken into account here. But one thing is for sure, Ponce de Leon would have killed for this information even though apparently his search for the fountain of youth was entirely a myth. It might have not even happened, who knows. Now I know some people are gonna look at this equation and be like, I am way too YOLO for this. I'd rather live fast and die at 20 than do all this crap. Well, too, I have to say, quality of life. If you treat yourself like crap, you know, fry your dopamine system, you're gonna be totally screwed up. All of the things in this equation that appear to lower mortality also appear to improve quality of life. We're not just talking about lifespan, we're talking about health span, enjoying your life. And I know someone in the comments is gonna be like, Mike, you're just basing all of these on loose associations in epidemiology. Yeah, some of these may not be causal, but until we have nanorobots that are tracking the mortality and outcome of every single lifestyle choice, this is kind of the best that we have. But feel free to keep your unhealthy habits and die younger and suffer. Also, by living a longer life through a vegan diet, we are also not shortening the lives of animals, which you totally love and are awesome. All right, so that's it for today. Let me know down below if there is any aspect of this equation that I might've forgot. Also, definitely cite some research to support that point. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.